Okay. Um, I don't know about a 50 foot tower, but let's see if that works. Uh, you can build bases to 50 foot towers, well, which we've done at the field day. Our tower was actually um, held up by an adapter at the bottom, which was 3D printed. So that's one application. We've not even started the presentation yet. Okay, so. Um, Obviously, we're here to talk about 3D printing. Um, it's probably obvious what it is. It's printing in three dimensions, um, but there are many ways to do that, and that's what we're going to talk about tonight. Um, so what is 3D printing? Um, it's a process of manufacturing which uh, uses layer uh, upon layer to build up an object. Um, it's called additive manufacturing because you're adding layers um, as opposed to subtractive manufacturing, which is like a mill, um, that could either be um, computer controlled or it could be manual. So um, that's that, or traditional manufacturing. Um, a little bit of history about 3D printing is it's actually been around for uh, a little bit. So it's been around in the 80s, and um, it started off as sort of um, like a professional machine, like for large corporations who were doing um, aerospace or they're doing auto manufacturers to manufacture their parts. Um, they're very expensive, like 40000 each, um, and they were building models that were um, un like unusable for anything. They're, they're models. They're very delicate um, and very basic one color. Um, so that's where we started off. Um, eventually in the 90s, you start coming out with things that are printing out plastic and you're seeing the materials, and that's sort of where it's coming into its prime, where um, MIT starts researching it. Um, so the universities are grabbing it, and you can actually start producing parts that uh, can be actually used. Um, you, you're not making powdered models anymore, you're actually using um, plastic, so you can actually start making tools that um, you can actually use. Um, fast forward to the early 2000s, um, this is where you start, um, the technology is growing in like the research and development area. Um, people are starting to talk about using biological agents. Um, we'll talk a little bit about that later, um, but sort of there, they did experimental kidneys, um, not full kidneys. If you know about um, like biochips where you're creating mini models and uh, they started printing out patterns on that. Um, 2008, 2009, you're starting to come into the, um, the sort of for the hobbyist, um, people are producing really cheap models, printers that can print themselves. Um, that's, that's what the RepRap project is called. Um, it's something, it's something replication. So um, rapid replication, you can build parts for a machine on a 3D printer. Um, if you came up and looked at this earlier, everything blue on this machine is 3D printed. So the idea is you can actually cheaply produce another machine that can replicate parts. And that was a sort of a university project that exploded into cheap 3D printing, and that's why we ha have um, this technology now available to us and not just the uh, corporations. Um, and now the past few years is where people have actually started using it for real-world applications. Um, 3D printed planes, 3D printed um, cars, um, 3D printed jaws, prosthetics. I have some pictures there which are really cool. And in 2014, SpaceX flew the first 3D printed engine. Um, so that rocket that we've been seeing landing, um, actually using 3D printed rocket engines. And that sort of puts some pictures here. Um, it's used with like a titanium powder alloy and it's shot at with lasers and that's actually what builds up this, this model. And the great thing about this is SpaceX can do all of this in home, like in their own manufacturing. They can do it quickly, they can do it cheaply. They don't have to send their plans to a lab. Um, it's not... It's not um, instantaneous in their day, but its development is down to like months. Um, I don't actually, I, I can't tell you for sure, but it's a lot shorter than sending your plans to the mill, getting it changed, sending it back. Um, you're seeing faster development. And this is really cool. Uh, this is the engine that they have on their side of their dragon capsule with the one of the engines that lifted away from the, um, the launch pad, actually in the capsule. Um, this is another nozzle that sort of what's inside, and um, this is to prove that it actually works. 
Um, and I sort of was mentioning the different types of printers like lasers and um, plastic. So we'll run through that really quickly. The first type is your fuse um, material, or we just call it extrusion. And that's where you're squirting out some sort of material um, that's hot and it cools down and fuses into a um, solid model. That's what this kind of printer is. These are the cheap ones, these are the ones that anyone can use because basically, this is what I tell people who have no idea what it is, it's a glue gun that's moving around. Um, so if you get really close to it, that gold part over there is just a uh, heated piece of metal with some tape around it, and that's all it is. That motor, that gear you see spinning, is forcing that plastic into the nozzle, which is coming out a little bit. The hole is really small. Uh, it's 0.35 millimeters. Um, some printers have a lot smaller than that. That's how you get higher resolution. Um, but this is what that is. And 80% of all the printers on the market um, for um, sort of hobbyists, this is the type you're going to see. And that's sort of up close. Um, you can see it's built up by layers of plastic, but we have one here, so this was cool. Um, the next type, that's the other 20% I'm going to say is for hobbyists, it's called um, a resin printer. Um, scientific name is photopolymerization. Um, a laser shoots a photoactivated material which hardens it together. Um, and that's, that image sort of shows it. Um, the, there's a plate underneath all this, all this gunk, I don't know what it's made of, but a laser shot at it and it hardens it. So, um, it builds up these, these models inside the plastic. And the cool thing about this is the resolution. Uh, that's sort of a picture with a penny to scale and you sort of get an idea of how um, small and how um, intricate these parts can be just because you're using a really fine laser. Question before you move. Yeah. The partial thing that's on the bottom is blue. Yeah. Point it out right here, what is it? Okay. This, kind of this is a different kind of printer. Oh. So the red, um, that's the, that's called an extruder, and that's what's hot, and that squirts out melted plastic. And that's the gold um, nozzle that's right on top of the yellow. The yellow is the plastic that's coming out. Um, but this type of printer, it actually uses a laser and a liquid. So it's a different type. I have a picture of one later in this slideshow. So we can get a pool of um, so this is a little close up. The laser comes out, and then there's like a scanner which moves it around, and that's sort of that's what gives you your shape. And there you go. You can see a little closer. You can actually kind of see the layers, um, but you can see how how much smaller. Um, this one's really cool. Um, this is just called a laser printer. It's actually called SLS, um, Selective Laser Sintering, and what it does it blows the powder into the laser, it hardens it instantly. Um, that's just one type, there's another type that actually uses like a, it's like a moving soldering iron, it actually builds it up. There's a lot more post-processing required, like sending it down, um, but you still get a solid metal object. And that's your about close. Um, this is what originally the, the technology sort of came from, it's called granular printing. And it works kind of like the laser printer, except this is actually made of like a grain. Um, it lays down a layer of powder and then runs an ink or a fuser on top of it, and then that hardens a layer. And then another layer of powder is sweeped across and hardened on top of it. Mm -hmm. And then you can actually see he's undusting it because you, you get this part inside a giant box of powder. So that's where, that's where this part comes from. These are cool because you can actually add color. So a lot of printers actually have like an inkjet, like in your printer at home, so you can actually get the color. So it's really cool, but it's not practical for actually making it a usable part. Um, because with these printers, the material that you're using is so important, I made a whole slide about it. Um, since I last gave this presentation at the TNT forum, there's been a huge amount of material that's become available to us. Um, originally it was ABS and PLA, and uh, ABS is what you make Legos out of, so you can tell it's a hard plastic, it's really durable, and PLA. Um, what I would say to PLA is, um, it's a bioplastic, it's just like ABS, except it's 
a little bit more brittle, so if you bend ABS, it sort of gives. If you bend the leg, it goes um, It's 15 to $35, depending on the quality you want to buy. So if you want to buy from China, you will get cheap plastic, but your prints will be awful. And um, if you want to pay a lot of money, like 30 or $40, um, you can get some really good quality filament. And what I would say to that is the quality is about how the plastic absorbs water from the air. Um, it sucks up moisture, so you have to keep it in desiccant, and the cheap plastic suck it up. And when it prints through it, you can actually see like steam coming out of, out of the bottom of your nozzle. And you can actually look at a print, and it, it's all bubbly. And it's, it's not good. So if you want to get in the hobby, buy from Amazon. Don't buy from Alibaba. <laughs> Um, some cool stuff that's come out, I added this, is um, conductive filament, carbon fiber, um, Kevlar filament. Um, these are all just people experimenting and creating some really cool stuff. Um, there's people who have wood and stone um, filaments, and really all that is is basically really fine wood chips in a, like a, it's basically stuck in PLA. And uh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't try that because obviously you get gunk in your nozzle and you can clog it. But if you buy really high quality stuff, you can actually get parts that feel like they're made of clay or that feel like they're made of wood. And some printers actually, or the companies sell you a little bit of software that you can install into your, your slicer, which is what develops your model. And it will actually change the temperature of your nozzle as it prints and you can actually get wood grain colors in it because the wood will burn as it goes through the, goes through the nozzle. And this is really cool. At the bottom here, you, this is just your normal stuff. And you can see I have one on the top of my printer. Um, but this is actually steel, steel filament. And what it is, it's just little bits of stainless steel in PLA. And you can actually shine it down. It makes it look like it's made of them. And of course, you're glow in the dark and put nice and stuff in here. So I talked about this a little bit earlier. Bioprinting, um, this is really cool. This is only really starting to come out or really starting to come sort of prevalent. And what people are doing, they're actually printing organs. Um, organs, mostly blood vessels right now. You can actually, there are people starting to get 3D printed blood vessels. And the cool thing about that is that when you make it, it's made in your own cells, so there's no rejection. And um, they're pretty easy to print blood vessels because they're just so um, you can sort of see how they do it. Um, you, there's two nozzles, one is your cells and one is your, it's called biological st structure support. And the cells are, actually I go in, I go up close in a second, but they print the cells inside this jelly and this, it both acts as a food and support. So the cells then fuse together and actually create the structure. Um, so as you can see up close how one layer like drops the cells and then it puts another one, just drops the cells, and then you get your final tissue after you um, sort of incubate it for a little bit. And we've done blood vessels and we've done ears. I didn't put those in here because those are kind of gross because it's just like an ear floating in a, in a, like a vat of jelly. Um, and they've also done heart valves, but I don't think those are FDA approved. Um, this is a spleen, I think, or a, it's a kidney. Um, there's a TED talk on it. It's really cool if you just Google up like bioprinting, and there's like a guy who's there who's got a 3D print spleen, and then like the scientist guy like pulls it out of the out of the pot. He's like, this is the second one. Like there's one of these inside this guy, and it, like save this guy's life. So that's really cool. But yeah, there's just a needle in it. It squirts the cells. And they they do their thing and they grow. Um, these are real, these have happened, you might see stories about it, people born or they have a horrible accident and they get their skull um, totally mashed up, um, their bone won't grow back, so what they do is they put, um, they put a prosthetic piece in and they're perfectly fitted to your skull because they take a scan and then they model it, um, so that's kind of cool. And what's even cooler about this is that skull is a 3D printed model of the guy or woman, I don't know, um, so then they modeled it on that. So you can take an MRI, turn that into a 3D scan, 3D print that, make the part, and 
it's perfect. So you might be thinking, how do I do this? This is super cool. Um, very briefly, we can talk about this more a little bit later. You design, or you download your file, and then you put it into a software, and then you print it. It's pretty much that easy. Um, it depends on what software you're using and all that, and what you prefer. Um, but then, that's it. Uh, everything's open source, so a lot of things are open source. Um, the software is always free, but of course you have to pay for the printer. That's how they get you. Um, but yeah, the 3D printing community is all open source. The plans for this are free. The 3D print files are free. Um, that's kind of, you know, how do I 3D print my printer? If I don't have a 3D printer, people make me buy those. But, so, that's how they get around that. Um, this is cool. A lot of movies now are 3D printing their costumes. So if you watch some things about Iron Man, the entire suit is 3D printed. And they sort of go behind the scenes and show you how they did that. So that's really cool if you like Iron Man. Um, this is one of those resin printers I was talking about, so they look a little different. If the, your printer has an orange or red case around it, it's probably a resin printer just because of the laser and they don't let it shoot up into your eyes. Um, that's the giveaway. And you can see how they're working on something. Um, if you have experience doing AutoCAD, that's great. Um, I put on there, does your software export in STLs? You can use any software you like as long as it exports an STL because that's the three print file. Um, it's made of triangles, and that's just what all of the um, softwares, the slicing softwares, look at. So when you download a file, it will be an STL. Um, some things that I like using are Autodesk, um, AutoCAD, um, Fusion 360. This this just came out, like the update. So maybe everyone here can make an educational account, go back to community college, and get it for free. Um, I would recommend doing that for all RDS products. Um, they're super good, and they all export in STLs, and they're really easy to use. Only the first step to this issue was three. Three years, so you get a three-year license. Can high school students get that? You can, just say you're in college or something. Well, I, I, I've got multiple <coughs> children. I might be able to uh, make them worth something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you can be a student teaching yourself how to use Autodesk. So that's what I think. Um, the catch is you can't use it for commercial purposes. But if you're just doing it for hobby, like, no problem. Um, Google SketchUp is free, but it's user hostile. And you have to download a ton of things to make it actually export STL. So I put it on there because it's free and you can do it. It's just awful. Um, and OpenSCAD is really cool too. It's for programmers. It's actually a CAD program based off of command line. So you can see like um, square, rectangle box, and you view the coordinates. Um, that's really cool. Yep. Yeah, I just want to learn on that. But if you guys were a couple years ago, I gave a talk on, uh, on the computer at Homebrewing. There's a program I used called Homebrewing, also in Geomagic. I have a version of that that is full for the multiple low end version of USTL. It goes from I, I would guess somewhere around that between a hundred and two hundred dollars. I'm gonna to check to be sure on that. That's the other one. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Um, if you have Windows, Microsoft 3D Builder comes native with it. It's the new Windows 10 update. Uh, I don't like it very much, but it works really well and it's designed for 3D printing. So if you have no idea how to use a CAD software, then use that one. Of course, there are many other. Yeah, it comes with Windows. If you'd like it, search it up. I'll come in. And I'll put just the name for you because you can use anything as long as you have the STL. So whatever it flows you go for. Um, if you want to buy one, I put a few 3D printing companies out there. Um, MakerBot is no longer on this list because they are not so great. I don't work for any of these companies too, but. But. Um, these are the really cool ones, and I know these ones. Um, and they're sort of, they're more open source. Um, most of them have really high quality printers. Um, Arrow 3D, um, Formlabs is the resin one, that little orange one that I just showed you. Um, Flash Wars, Forge, Lost Bond, Naked Gear. You don't have to remember those, but I just know that these ones are really good ones. Um, some of these new ones, um, this actually, 
this is a really good time because CES is happening right now. And every single day, there's something new about 3D printing coming out because like the star of CES right now is 3D printing. So give it a few weeks. There might be some new companies on this list. Um, but a ton of good printers are always coming on the market now. So there's lots of opportunities to actually come into the, the hobby. Um, just if you want to talk to me about it, you can email me and I will gladly assist you in buying one. Um, and I kind of put this on here as a joke, it's like the replicator for Star Trek. <laughs> <laughs> so this is like part one is over. So any questions? Yeah. You can talk about Zola. What? Zola? Yeah, later. Uh, no questions. Yeah. Because of price uh, range. Okay. That's actually a really good question. I can tell you that they're either from three hundred to five thousand um, dollars that you pay for quality. Um, the printer on the screen, this one right here, you can get two material like options. You can print two materials. That goes for about three thousand to four thousand. No, that's an Airwolf UHD or something like that, or an Axiom. This is about $700. So your average printer is going to be between $700 and $2,000. Uh, give or take. Uh, your roll of ABS is anywhere from, I would say, about $30. Yeah. Yeah, because like, I was actually shopping myself, uh, Lulzbot, and I believe the Lulzbot Mini. That, comes for, that may drop the price from $1,400 to $1,250. Yeah, so around that price range, Wallsbot is really good. They make really big um, printers. Um, if you obviously, you pay for having a big printer. Most people are just having it on their desktop, so you can go for a smaller one, and those ones are around the $1,100 $1 range. There are ongoing costs with plastic and everything, but once you get a roll, it lasts for a long time. So you pay about $30 for a roll, and that'll last you a long time. If you've got a yeah, filament printer, You can make you can make your own plastic for a lot cheaper. Okay. Um, so how do you print something? Um, I kind of already talked about this, but I want to sort of go into more detail and how you might start going about this. So if you want to three D print something, um, the first thing is to like identify what you want to print. So if you, um, I'm going to use this as an example. If you have a problem and you want to fix it, um, and you're like, where do I buy this part? That's where you should think 3D printing, because um, if you can draw it in your CAD program, then you can print it out somehow. A lot of people are using it to um, make brackets, so they don't have to go to like, the hardware store and buy it, you can actually get personalized stuff. Um, I might show you a print, because that's really cool. Um, this is a tape beam antenna, and a lot of people use um, the, the pipe clamps, but you know, just 3D printed, it, so a little bit nicer looking, and it comes custom to the, the pipe. So I'll pass this around, you can sort of feel it as 3D printed. Um, you actually brought your, this is really cool, so he printed a guy rope line for his antenna. Um, I don't know if you like want to pass it around, or I can just hold it up if you're comfortable with that, but he showed it to me. You slide it on top of your antenna and you hook your um, ropes to it. And that's just one of the things. You can't buy that, or you can buy it and pay a lot of money for it. So, is it okay if you pass this around? Yeah? Do you have a project? No, this is only guy in the work. Next thing is to get a jar and download it. Um, we talked about modeling softwares, um, but I didn't talk about Thingiverse. And Thingiverse is a giant online database of 3D printed things. So if you think of something, go to Thingiverse first, and then see if it's on there. If it's not, then you can design it yourself. Um, nine or 10 times, your thing will be there. Um, parts of your 3D printer will be on there. Um, 
everything up here um, was on Thingiverse, with the exception of the wing. So the drone finds are for free on the internet. Um, the code hook, the, the skull, and all that stuff. It's all free. Um, sometimes you don't need this. Um, if you're going open source, you need a slicing thing, a slicing application, and then you need a printer controller. And it's called a slicer because it actually takes your file and breaks it down into lots of layers. So you slice it. And then that's, it actually generates a special file called a G code, and that's the type of machine code which the printer reads line by line, and then it does its, and it does its print. Yep. And that all depends on the firmware of your printer. And then finally, 3D printing. If you don't have a 3D printer, this is this is the sort of important point. If you don't have a 3D printer, there are lots of options for you. Um, there are tons of services out there who are making money off of people not having printers. Um, and that's sort of smart. Um, the main one is 3D hubs. People set up hubs all over, and you just upload your file, and you can click on them. Um, I run one, so I need a 3D print something. Um, you can just send it to me. Shapeways, um, they also do that for you. They can do things like metal. Um, there's a company just down the road called Custom 3D Stuff. Um, they 3D print a ton of things. You can send them your file. And then, of course, Makerspaces. Um, if you've heard of Nova Labs, um, if you've heard of Fab Labs, um, if you've heard of Maker Fair, um, those are all great places to go. There are groups of people, kind of like our club, um, but they're all about making things. So there's a whole community for 3D printing, there's a whole community for laser cutting, and if you send an email or something like that, then you can get your part in. And of course, local libraries. Um, I think it's Reston has a huge 3D printing lab, and um, Fairfax Library has a really big 3D printing lab. Um, usually, you can just go in there and 3D print something. So that's really cool. Community centers. Let's do a quick Google search of like local 3D printers. Um, and that's it. And then I sort of put a slide in here. Because it's CES, there's a lot of exciting things coming up. So I put a little slide here about sort of where is 3D printing going. And um, we'll see if the audio works, but this is really cool. And this is sort of something that we're going to see um, coming up in the future. And then once this video is over, um, you can come up, look at the printer, ask questions, and we have a bunch of different parts up here that you can come and look at too. So, yeah. We designed to be upgraded with different materials as we release them in the future. A printer print similar to typical printing is ready for change. What would you do if you could 3D print electronics? At Voxel 8, we're revolutionizing 3D printing by developing a full three-dimensional electronics printing platform. So if you take a look at a lot of what's been printed up until now, there really amounts to trinkets in 3D printers. And as we look to the future, that's where I think we're going to start creating things that only 3D printers could have made. The circuits of today are flat two-dimensional circuit boards that are embedded into three-dimensional cases. Now this whole paradigm is going to change because we're enabling designers to create circuitry and physical objects at the same time using Voxelate's 3D printing technology. Over the past decade, the Lewis Group has carried out thousands of experiments to create new materials for three-dimensional printing. I'm really excited to move this technology out of my lab into Voxelate. With our developer's kit printer, you will be able to integrate electronics into mechanical objects. You will be able to print devices like quadcopters and integrated electromechanical assemblies that typically have to be manufactured through multiple methods. Our conductive ink is specifically formulated for 3D printing. Prints and dries at room temperature, has excellent electrical properties, and has excellent adhesion to other matrix materials. We want to make it simple for users to create 3D printed parts with embedded functionality. We've partnered with Autodesk to make an end-to-end -end pipeline to do just that. Wire enables users to bring in their CAD models, to place components, to route wires in 3D using the Autodesk Spark platform. And that's really happening for the very first time. The software for this simply did not exist before. We're fundamentally materials experts, so we created a platform specifically designed to be upgraded with different materials as we release them in the future. Our printer prints similar to typical 3D printers, layer by layer. To place a part, the printer stops, allows you to remove the bed, 
place the part inside of the material, and then replace the bed on the printer. It will print right where it left off, knowing that there's a part inserted inside of it. We're excited to work with companies like Voxel 8 because they're really pushing the boundaries of where 3D printing is capable. And by incorporating inductive inks directly in the 3D printing process, we can start to create things that function after they're created. In order for 3D printing to reach its full potential, we need a broad palette of functional materials coupled with the ability to have a multi-material 3D printing platform. With these kinds of tools at hand, we can truly print our imagination. It's really cool and all this stuff is sort of coming out now and um, it's kind of exciting to see what's going to be happening so uh, that sort of does it um, are there any, any questions